Hello again, everybody. This is Dan Clouser, and welcome back to the Journey of My Mother's Son podcast. Now I'm joined with Rosabelle Lekising, who's an entrepreneur, coach, speaker, co-author of the book called Thought Leaders, Visionaries, and Influencers, and founder of Connecting You. Rosa, thanks for joining me today. You're so welcome. It's my pleasure, Dan. You bet. So just to give a little background, um, Rose and I met through being on a virtual stage together um, through uh, Your Words Have Power, uh, which is uh, a thing that Wendy Corner does. So we, we met about a month ago. Uh, we were both speakers for Wendy's event. And uh, Rose's topic really resonated with me. And uh, I don't know, maybe two days after the event, I think I'd reached out to you and said, Mm-hmm. You know, Rose, I'd love to have you on the podcast and kind of expand on, on what we talked about there. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, to having this conversation. And, you know, Rose's topic was, you know, what were you thinking? And we'll talk about a little bit that a little bit more. But before we get into that, I just, you know, Rosa, introduce yourself um, in your own words to the audience. You know, who is Rosa today? Thank you so much, Dan. It was a pleasure to meet you. I loved your talk as well when you spoke about less is more and that really caught my attention. So we resonated at some level, you know, yours and mine interconnected. And uh, that's why I also made sure I connected with you right away. It's like, hey, Dan, we got to talk, right? And uh, you were uh, also very clear in your comments. So this was wonderful. It's a wonderful connection. And uh, this is how connections happen, is when we resonate at some level, either in thought, word, or deed. And uh, this is why thoughts are so important. So when I talked about what are you thinking, uh, we clearly see that our thoughts uh, manifest into the words we put out there, the messages we put out there, and then the reality that comes out of it, the outcomes that come out of that, right? So to go back a little bit to how I got here and what my background is, I was uh, actually, I was born in Trinidad and Tobago and uh, migrated to Canada about 40 years ago. And uh, my career took off in different directions. And, And so after leaving the bank, I started to work on... Con- making connections. And I it, it just became so natural that no matter where I worked, I was helping coach people, get them out into the world, connect them to somebody, um, have teach them networking skills. And so eventually all of that led to me starting my own business six years ago as a networking coach. And it was mostly, it was for entrepreneurs because I had already worked with internationally trained professionals. But uh, having worked with the employer market who are hiring these professionals, I saw that their needs were very similar to job seekers in making the right connections for their businesses, especially for small business owners. So that was a wonderful start uh, six years ago. And then that when I saw that it was still difficult for them to make connections, they did networking, but making the connections became a challenge. I started to teach connection skills. So then I become the connector. And, as a, and then as a connector, I saw that we still weren't collaborating effectively. So how do we do that? What's missing? So I did a retreat and became a matchmaker. I physically felt moved to match people together. I'd go, okay, you're not doing this fast enough. I'm going to do it with you. And so I started to match people And uh, it was easy for me because I was already in a mentoring program where I matched employers and employees before. And uh, that was fun. But here's where it ended up. I saw that alignment was missing. So one of the reasons we had struggles in, in being matched properly and collaborative partners, it was because a lot of us were not aligning our services with our values and vision. So then that transformed me into an alignment coach. And now that's what I do uh, mostly. It's one-on-one coaching and a few small group coaching on alignment. Why is it so important to be aligned? And how is being aligned make it easier to communicate and attract the right people and reduce the stress and have an easier life? Yeah, I I love that. And, you know, I think 
one of the things that really resonated with with me, you know, during your your talk, um, you know, on our virtual stage together was just, you know, so many people, and I've had a lot of guests on on the show who talk about the same thing. So many people don't understand how much we can kind of control our thoughts and how much those thoughts um, really play out in everything that happens to us. You know, like it starts here and, right. you know, mind, body, and spirit, it's all tied together. And, you know, I think that's one of the things that, you know, why I wanted to have you on the show is just to, you know, to be able to expand on that. And it's something I just want to continue to drive home because people think that, you know, they can't change their, their mind and their thought pattern. You know, it's something they've, they've just, you know, been brought up and, you know, they're now, you know, 50 years old or 60 years old. And just, this is just the way it is. And that's really not the case. Like you can change it and it's never too late to change those thought patterns. So, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, just that exercise of, you know, getting yourself into a positive mindset and not constantly beating yourself up and, you know, all that stuff that we do so naturally as human beings, you know. Exactly. exactly. Thank you. You know, um, it is true. And one of the worst things we can do for ourselves is when we make that affirmative statement saying, I am this way. And that's just who I am. Now, the minute a human being says that, they have declared who they are being and what the outcomes are going to be. And just as we say, I am with limitation, we can say, I am with no limitation. We can then change that statement and say, I am a spiritual being with a physical experience on this earth that I have the power to change at any time. So that's how what thoughts came up to me, because as I was teaching internationally trained professionals, I noticed that when they came to Canada, they said, well, I'm an engineer. I can't do anything else. Or I am Iranian. This is how we operate. I, I can't do that. I am an introvert. I don't know how to do that. I, I can't take that job. And it puzzled me because I, the more I realized how limited we are in our thoughts, the more I was driven to help them shift that. So I started teaching exercises on how do you, how do you, how do you use your physiology to integrate these new thoughts into your being? So I would have workshops where at 8.30 in the morning, I would have them dancing to flash dance. And my manager and my colleagues would be walking along the hall and going, what's going on there? What's she up to now? Right? Remember, these are internationally trained professionals who are shy when they get here. It may not be shy in their home, but when they get here, they're a little bit introverted and shy and not so. But now I got them dancing. It's a different language. That's a common language, like singing, like any other creative skill. So we get them moving and dancing and singing and they're, and uh, now the physiology is a little bit more open. The body is open. So once we start energizing the body and the mind together, the spirit naturally raises its vibration. So once I get them raising the vibration in the classroom, it's easy for me to get through to them. It's Listen, at the end of the day, we're all doing this for ourselves. I want to have an easy time teaching you. <laughs> so I'm really doing this for me. I am no philanthropist in this world, right? So it became so much more fun getting them interactive and getting them asking questions and letting them know that I don't have all the answers. And it's like, ask any question. So I would start off every, every workshop with, what are you thinking? And uh, they started talking to me differently because they realized I cared for something deeper within them. So that whole body, mind, spirit, there, were, there are tons of exercises that I used to get people realizing that you can change your vibration. And one of them is putting your hand on your heart and thinking for a moment with your eyes closed of somebody that you love deeply. 
and feel that feeling. And as you feel that feeling, what do you think happens? Again, the, 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 the reading, if we were to do a chart at that time and they were to check your aura, they check how the heart rate, the vari heart rate variability is, you would see how different it's become in just those few moments. Yeah. So I would just find tons of exercises to, in, to introduce into the classroom to get people shifting their perspectives. And it's only then they could actually start realizing I can change my thought. Yeah. I, I love that. I love that. And, and I think, like you said, I mean, everybody is going to come into that situation with a little bit of a shield up, you know, just being in a, in an unknown situation. I know, you know, personally, um, I hated networking events. Um, I hated them with a passion. I, I am an introvert. You know, a lot of people don't believe that because I host a podcast and I can really connect with people, but I, I can't have a conversation like this with someone who I find is superficial, you know? So the, what makes my podcast tick is the fact that I find people who I can connect with on, on a deeper level and have that conversation. Cause I'm, you know, as an introvert, you're just not into small talk. You no, know? right. like you want to actually connect with people. And I think that's something that's very misunderstood when it comes to, to introverts. So, you know, as you saw them kind of break down, you know, those barriers and, you know, kind of let their guard down. You mm -hmm. know, what was that like for you as, you know, as the teacher, the instructor, you know, yeah. in that classroom to kind of just see that, you know, right in front of your eyes, just kind of let them let, break down those barriers. I tell you, it, it did something for me and my growth every single time. It remind it, it felt like all of a sudden I was bouncing. And now I'm off my feet and off the ground. I'm bouncing around because now I feel connected to all the people in the room. And I feel like my spirit was moving across the room. It wasn't just my body there anymore. So they gave me an opportunity to show up as spirit once they engaged in these activities. And when I became more of a spirit-centered person, the more their heart opened, and started to laugh and cry and sing. And then we do lunches together. And then they would they would want to bring me desserts and lunch the next day and, and serve. You know, they wanted to give me so much because they didn't know they were going to get so much. And you know, it is it was never about how good a resume they did they got or how good a job they got. It was always about how good do I feel today? And how come I'm feeling so much better after three weeks or four weeks in Rose's class than I did in the other class? What was that all about? So that for me was continuous transformation. When I could cause transformation in a room, it caused me to transform and made me more humble. Because when I'm not in that space, my left brain gets into judgment mode. And then I go, oh, gosh, why is she wearing so much clothes with all those things around her head and her face? She must be sweating. I could hear those thoughts. But when I got into this state, then those thoughts vanished, disappeared. I saw the human being inside of there. And no more did I care what they wore. Right? How the hair was or nothing. So it, it, just, it, it, it just made me realize that it was so important for us to live what we believe as a human being on this earth, because the more you live it, the more you impact others in a positive way, because the maker, the creator of God gave you these gifts for a reason. So if that is your gift, then for heaven's sake, use them. And don't hide them away under a bushel like that uh, saying that Marion Williamson wrote years ago about, you know, showing up and don't be afraid to shine your light in case somebody else, you know, uh, says something about you. It is a gift that we all have. And it's, it's critical for me to identify what that is and allow myself to grow with you as I give you a gift. Every time I give you something, I get something. That's what 
it for me. It made me whole, kept making me more and more whole. And uh, the more whole I become, the more I could handle the next challenge that's coming my way. Because there's going to be challenges all the time to move us back into disintegration or disarray or disruption and have us be scattered all over again. And then we have to pick up the pieces and come back. But don't you find that when we stay on this trajectory, that every time we have a disruption, we can come back much faster? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that goes back to, you know, initially when, you know, when I first got into to business, there was always this saying that, you know, business is business. You don't take it personal, yada, yada, yada. And I, I you know, from day one, I couldn't agree with that because, you know, people buy from people, people want to interact with people. So I think the fact that, you know, in a business setting, you were taking the, the quote unquote business out of it and exactly. really making it human. That's and I, I think that's something that we really, you know, desperately need in, you know, our society today, <laughs> just to be able to recognize each other as humans again. You know? exactly. Dan, when I took on a contract at uh, uh, Centennial College, I was working with students, engineering students. Here is Miss Communicator, Miss Connector, Miss Networker, right? And they gave me engineering students. Oh, wow. So these were co-ops. I had to get co-ops for them. And they're all between 18 and 19, you know. And I'd go into class and then you'd see a few of them sleeping off and dozing off. And it's like, oh, wow, how do I get them awake? Wow. So I had to pull all the tricks from my hat to get them away. And sometimes I had to be very direct, you know, and uh, just say, you know, um, hey, we are all committed to something here. We are all here for a specific reason. And if this is not what you signed up for, then we need to have a talk. So it is not simply you're tired or you stayed up late last night. You will be asked to stay back and talk with me for 10 minutes after the class. So I will be writing your names down, guys. You know what? I still love you. We're still going to have fun, but for those who are just, so, so there were all kinds of things. The, it, I worked on getting them to open up to me, to show up. And, and I showed them that they were there to show up for themselves and nobody else. And uh, then I showed them the value of showing up for the group as well, how they impacted a community. And then I showed them how they show up for their families and blah, blah, blah. So then the next thing you know, they were running into my office asking me to help them with their cover letter and this and that. And I had students all the time when I wasn't in the class. And the other guy who was a bit older than me at the time, he was doing this for many years and secure job. He called me in his office and he said, hey, Rosa, you need to talk. I go, yeah, sure. What, what's up? Can't remember his name. He says, listen, you're on a contract, right? I said, yeah, yeah, I know it's happening and it's coming soon. I said, in a few months, I'm good Lord, you know, I'm going to have to figure it out. He says, well, listen, I would hate to see you go. He says, I really would love you to stay. He says, but you know what I'm worried about? I said, no, pray tell. Just, you're making it hard on us. You're having all these kids come into your classroom and now they're expecting us to do the same. I can't keep up. He says, will you stop? I said, I'm so sorry, I can't help you. I said, no, I'm not going to stop. Everywhere I worked, they, they required me to stop doing what I was doing. And I said, no, every time. I said, no. It, has it impacted my numbers? Is there a problem with my work? Delivery? Performance? Anything? No, no, no. Okay, good. Then I'm on a roll. You know, and so it, it, I, you, I mean, yeah, they call us shit disturbers. I don't think so. I, whatever, love disturbers. I create love. I, one lady said to me, What is it with you? I was in a community. I said, Why? She said, You walk around and you demand love on the universe. I said, Really? Well, I think I'm going to take that as a compliment. 
<laughs> it meant to be. She says, I'm not sure. And she started to laugh. I said, you sounded upset when you said it, but I don't know why you would be. And we had a long talk. You know, eventually that girl had cancer because she was angry at so many things. And I became her best friend. She eventually died. But, uh, you know, it showed me how I made some people uncomfortable. And that's why one of the books that I'm planning to write is Get Comfortable Being Uncomfortable. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And it, it goes back to, I think it was... Uh... I think it was a quote by Maya Angelou, I believe, who you know, said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Exactly. And that, that is so true, you know, and, and when people understand that you, you know, care for them and love them, you know, at a much deeper level than what, you know, you're there to teach them about, that's when you really resonate. And, and that's something that, you know, again, resonates with me because one of the blessings that I've had that Sandy and I have had since we've been traveling full time in, in an RV is being able to connect with a lot of my old players, you know, that I'd coached that are scattered, you know, throughout the United States and, you know, seeing these guys and girls, um, you know, 20, 30 years after, you know, I coached the last game with them and what they're doing today in society and understanding that, you know, what I was teaching at that point was much bigger than, than the game, you know? So, yeah. you know, you don't always get to see those seeds that you've planted, you know, right. bloom. So that's one of the things that's been a, an incredible blessing for, for us on this journey. Um, you know, since we've started to, just to be able to see that and kind of connect those dots and, and understand that. I mean, was this something that you, you know, you've been able to kind of connect on this level your entire life or was there, you know, a certain kind of aha moment where you had a shift um, to, you know, go this direction? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. You know, I had to look back um, because I've been asked that uh, several times and I was surprised when I started digging how far back it went. And so um, in, 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 elementary school, I was always asked to be prefect or leader in the classroom. You know, I always seemed to know that there was something to be done and then took the initiative to do it. So that was fine. However, I, I, I didn't feel as open to talk to everybody in the classroom, but I selected my people. So a lot of what I was doing there was resonating with the right people. I was selective. When I went to high school, it was different. Um, again, yes, I was selective, but I was in boarding school. So what happened in my third form in boarding school, in those days, it was form one, form five, we had the British system where I was in Trinidad. And they, I was selected as head of house. And again, I was surprised because usually they pick somebody from the higher form, form four, now in three. And how did that happen? So here's me at about 15, um, being head of house for about 60 girls. And again, the same thing happened. I, I was connecting people, helping people out. And I was voted the most helpful. So it seemed to be part of who I was. I was an explorer's um, uh, girl guides, the whole bit, joined everything, loved the picnics and love to play and like teams. So that kept growing. And then when I was 21, I had my dad asked me what I wanted to do. I said, I want to have a birthday party at home. And he said, oh, wow, okay. And he said, so how many people are you going to invite? I said, well, I don't know, maybe 30, 35. Wow, okay. You know, and I'm thinking that's a small amount. But in Trinidad, you have big uh, verandas, big living rooms, and these wooden houses. So you have space. Well, all my friends said, invite twice the amount, because half of them won't show up. I said, oh, okay. So I invited 75 people. I didn't even know I knew 75 people. I invited 75 people. Dan, you want to know how many people showed up? 75? 76. <laughs> <laughs> One more. 
that was a defining moment for me. I hadn't realized how happy people were around me, that they wanted to be there, you know. And so that connected to, as I started working, I had all these connections. If I ever needed passports for the family, anything, I called a friend. He said, no, you don't have to come. Just send it to me in an envelope. I'll get it done for you. Making connections was as easy as snapping my finger and networking. And I came to Canada and every single job I got was through a connection. Oh. I've never had to look for a job, except once, a uh, retail uh, position, because that was not my forte. And I got the, the first interview I had, I, I got it. But other than that, every other thing was a connection. So I think it was in my DNA. My father was a community um, social aid. And he, I, that definitely took on some of his genes because the whole village knew him right. and he was definitely a connector. So in my genes. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you were in the corporate world, you know, your, your entire career. And then six years ago, you decide to, you know, leave your own comfort zone at that point and, and go into business for yourself, which can be incredibly scary. Um, what, you know, what made you take that leap? I mean, you certainly could have wrote out, you know, staying in corporate, you know, in the corporate world, you know, till your retirement. And then you instead you decide to shift into this, you know, very unknown world of, of entrepreneurship. Yes, Dan, what a scary, scary journey. Um, and yet um, so fulfilling. So I, my chapter in the book, uh, Thought Leaders, Visionaries and Influencers was, um, aunt, uh, now I'm forgetting the title, but it's about how to build a community of heart centered entrepreneurs, building community through entre entrepreneurship. That's what it was. And I saw that when I was in corporate, that that was missing, there was no community, there was self sufficiency and independence hardly even interdependence. And I studied Stephen Covey and I loved every word he wrote and everything about my life. I, as Lady Gaga says, I was born this way. Everything in my life was about interconnecting and interdependence. And I saw the big picture already as an eight year old, but constantly through my work, I wasn't seeing it live and I was confused. And the more I pushed to bring that community spirit in, the more kickback I got, the more, you know, rebuttal I got, the more I got people asking me questions. Why are you doing it this way? Why can't you conform was really the question. And I guess I realized I won't conform. Whether I can't, I don't know, but I won't. So as stubborn as anything, I chose a path and I stuck to it. And when I realized that I would have to conform in order to be successful to the level at, that I would want, I decided to slip away. I, I picked up the keys twice and just took it to the uh, boss's desk and said, I can't do this anymore. I got to go. And uh, it was oftentimes when they didn't know how to resolve something without being competitive without laying down the line. And I just had to call them on what they were doing each time. So I got tired of calling managers on, on their stuff. And I just thought, okay, <clears throat> stop being a shit disturber. Just go in a place where you could bring harmony and peace. And I went to the not-for-profit side. Instead of staying in recruiting, I, I, where we could place one person and make you know 10,000 a month or 8,000, and sometimes you wait for two months before you can make the next sale because it takes a while to place an executive. I thought, while I'm so busy doing that, I can't serve the other 95%. I want to go to the 95% and help them learn how to fish instead of giving them a fish. So I went over to the not-for-profit side. And uh, that's when I worked with international trained professionals and helped them. And that's when it was fulfilling because I had some flexibility to design workshops the way I felt it was beneficial for my clients. 
And I was able to then influence my managers there and say, how about if we do it this way? What do you think? Look at the stats, see how it works. When they saw the stats improve, and of course they agreed with my style. You know, I took people to Toastmasters. I didn't just refer them. I took a class of 12 to Toastmasters. IT professionals at one time where you ask, they're asked for, to do the impromptu. And I expected two of them to get up and do the impromptu one minute. Guess what? All 12 <laughs> got up and did an impromptu talk. How is that possible if there wasn't heart and connection in, in that teaching. So it was that yearning. My spirit and my soul wanted to be satisfied at every turn of my career. And it wasn't being fulfilled in corporate. And no amount of money could have satisfied me. And so I just realized, look, I guess my life is not going to be about money. It's going to be about success in filling hearts and raising hearts and building heart bridges, building bridges through hearts connection. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, that sense of community is, you know, something that, again, really resonates with me because, um, you know, before Sandy and I started traveling, we were very much involved in our, you know, home community back in Pennsylvania. But it always, it also felt very shallow and very superficial. And one of the things we've experienced in the RV community is that it truly is a community. And even though, you know, we've got friends that, you know, we may only see, you know, a couple months, you know, from each other where, you know, we'll be on a volunteer project together or, you know, we're fortunate enough to be in the same area at the same time and we connect. And that sense of community in the RV community is so much stronger than what we experienced, you know, beautiful home so to speak and yes. you know again it's something that I think we're definitely lacking you know I mean there was a, a time where you know you could go you know I remember when I was a kid my mom sending me over to our neighbor's house for a stick of butter or something or you know right. a cup of sugar or vice versa you know that's just stuff that you did <laughs> um, yet when we lived in our you know our house in Pennsylvania for 20 plus years um, never once did we step in one of our neighbor's houses or vice versa. You know, I mean, we we're out in the suburban area. It wasn't like a development. So we had a big, you know, a big lot, you know, two acres. And, you know, so it wasn't like we we're on top of each other, but there still certainly was no sense of community in that setting. So it's interesting to me that you, that lack of community um, was so strong for you that you decided to, to venture off and, you know, essentially create your own community, which I think is, you know, a perfect, you know, why it led to the the name of your your company, connecting, right. connecting you, you know, yeah, connecting you. It's like a song to me. It's 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 a it's a lifetime song to me when I can make connections and when I can cause it. Sometimes it's not even a physical saying, Dan, meet Henry. It's a it's 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 that dance that we have at an at an event, and because we are playing together, I by energy alone can connect you. So I bring three people together instead of two, and I go, hey, you know what? Have you ever done this? And and what about you? Oh, well, listen, you guys should talk to each other, and I move on to the next group of three, and I tend to do that naturally. Because I want to see people play and engage. And then you and I know that when we play, we connect faster. Mm -hmm. So why then do companies insist that you work with a serious face all day, take a 10-minute break, get back to your desk, and, and, and you log you uh, for if you take five minutes extra or if you walk into the office five minutes late in the morning? What a pile of nonsense that is. Is that living or is that surviving? So here's people who have different concepts of what surviving means. They think because they make $200,000, they're living. They're merely surviving yeah. with a ton of money in the bank. There's no soul, no spirit there. How are you living? One only lives when your spirit comes to life. Yeah. How is that not taught in business? I, that baffles my brain. So guess what my current workshop is? I have a free workshop that I do once a week, and it's called 
know what truly motivates you to come alive every single day. Love that. Right? Why is it important to come alive every day? We have to listen. Why are we going to robots? We already have 10,000, thousands of robots walking around the earth. They just don't have the mechanical. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I can see things so clearly. And I think that's why I'm a disruptor because I see things that others don't yeah. and ask the hard questions. Why are you doing it this way? Can't you see how much easier it would be if we did it this way? And they don't, Dan, they don't see it. So now I've had to develop a deeper compassion for those who see it differently and learn a new type of communication to be able to influence or persuade them to look through a different set of lenses. And that's why I will never stop studying or learning from others or taking courses, uh, because unless we understand how all different human beings and personality types function, it would not be that easy to actually build community. So yeah. building community is a lifetime job. Yeah. And that's what I pledge my life to. I, I love that. And you you would think that after what we went through, you know, with the pandemic in 2020 and, and beyond, where that sense of community was just completely ripped from us, um, that we would have learned. And and I thought that we were on the right track initially. And it seems like we went right back to where we were so quickly. <laughs> Yes, yes. And it, it shows how shallow we are as a human race. It shows how, mm, I, I don't even know what word to use it. Is it that we are lazy to think? Is it that comfort gets us um, snuffed out? Because when you have the comfy couch and the TV, everything else gets snuffed out. So you don't even think, what are the messages on TV that's filling my brain and I'm going to bed with that without thinking of spending 10 minutes talking to my daughter about how was her day? You know, I, I remember teaching a, a group of salesmen one time. My brother had this company asked me to teach a sales course to a group of eight salespeople. And the second day, one chap came over to me with tears in his eyes and he said, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And I go, wait a minute, you're still coming back for the next day. We have two days to go. Where are you going? He says, no, no, you don't understand. I said, well, help me understand then what's going on. He said, Rosa, from what you shared with us yesterday, I realized I had to take time to talk to my two-year-old daughter and I talked with her last night and we hugged and, and he couldn't even talk about it without tears coming to his eyes. And of course, tears came in mine. And I'm going, that's so amazing. That's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing it with me. So if this is what it's causing when we teach about what are you thinking? Really, are you even thinking? Or have you become a robot? It's a big question. It breaks my heart when I see how many people walk around this earth as robots and get annoyed when we bring up deep conversations and say, no, I got to go have a beer. This is too deep for me. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's amazing. It's amazing. Rosa, man, I could talk to you about this all, all day long. It's a very, very interesting subject for sure. But um we're just about out of time, but is there anything that we missed that you want to make the listeners aware of before we uh, well, get a question? Thank you. I, I think what I'd like people to know is that entrepreneurs need a lot of care and attention. Entrepreneurs are one of the world's greatest <laughs> invention, whatever you want to call it, because entrepreneurs put their heart and soul into their business. They stepped away from the mainstream for specific reasons, some of them similar to mine. And when there is not a structure or a system that could support their mental, emotional, and physical and spiritual well-being, 
um, it means that those of us who are coaches need to pay attention to that to serve them. And I have devoted my life now to serving entrepreneurs to understand why well-being and self-care is so important on this journey. And so that before you can plan out your strategies and your marketing and all of that, get back in touch with who you really are and what is it you're here to do on this earth. Yeah, I love that. Rose, if anybody wants to reach out to you and, you know, dive a little deeper into this topic, uh, attend one of your workshops, um, how do they find you on the internet? Well, I'm on LinkedIn, so um, we will have that link um, in there. I'm on Facebook, and it's just at Rosa Lokaising. And uh, I'm on I, I'm on Instagram, but just learning how to use it right. So you'll see me on Instagram at, at Rosa Lokaising. Um, and Twitter, well, who knows if I'm going to keep up my Twitter. <laughs> um, and I have a website http connectingyouca So, and that needs, uh, that has uh, basic information, needs upgrading. Um, where else would you find me? Um, those would be the uh, current places. And, you know, um, yeah, if, if we put my phone number in there, people can call me, you know, um, contact me. So, yeah, I'm open. I'd love to have conversations with people. And, uh, and, and just explore what their journey is. Yeah. Love it. Love it. I love that you make yourself so accessible as well. It really does prove that, you know, you are genuine and authentic. And I think that's what, I think your success is due to your, you know, authenticity for sure. I think that's what, you know, again, something we've lost in society is, you know, that people want authenticity. People want you to be genuine. Um, we're, we're tired of the, you know, the charade and, and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, kudos for you for, for staying genuine. Thank you for saying that because authenticity is a really um, a, a word that, that's played out a lot. And sometimes we, we think it's not being used right, but it's a, it's, it's a pure word. So thank you for saying that. I, I feel it's important and, you know, I'll do my best to keep that going. Absolutely. So that brings us to our final question. As you know, the subtitle of the podcast is Many Little People in Many Little Places, which comes from the opening lyrics of a Michael Fronte song, which go, when many little people in many little places do many little things, then the whole world changes. What's one of the little things that Rosa does on a daily basis to make the world a little bit better place? I smile. I smile with people. I don't just smile to be liked and loved. I smile because I want you to know I like and love you. And I open my heart. Love that. That, um, that's actually probably one of my most common answers. Um, so I think if we can all continue to do that and all, you know, be able to, you know, give those that we pass a, a genuine smile and a you know, little wave, I think that'll make the world a much better place for sure. So I, I love that answer. Thank you so much, Dan. It was a real, real pleasure talking with you. I so love that you asked me and uh, look forward to keeping connected with you. Absolutely. I loved it. And for those out there listening, be sure to check out my other podcasts and blogs at journeymymotherson.com or danclauser.com. While you're there, pick up a copy of my most recent book, The Journey of My Mother's Son, Volume 1. Rosa, again, thank you so much for the conversation. I really enjoyed this. My pleasure, Dan.